I think we have a critical mass. So now also officially, ladies and gentlemen, good evening in Europe and good afternoon on the other side of the pond. And uh, warm welcome to our panel discussion, which is dedicated to the questions, how sustainable is civic activism under shrinking spaces? And what are the experiences and lessons learned from Central and Eastern Europe with illiberalism, democratic backsliding, and the shrinking spaces phenomenon? My name is Daniel Hegedusch. I work as senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and lead GMF's regional programming uh, and democracy assistance work called Engage in Central Europe. I feel honored that our panel, which is co-organized with International IDEA, can be part of the Global Democracy Coalition's official Summit for Democracy side event series. As you might be aware, over the past two years, the Summit for Democracy process has been actively criticized for allegedly representing an outdated Cold War mindset, for unnecessary deepening political cleavages among countries, and for hampering cooperation on essential topics like climate change that must be kept up irrespectively of the political system of sovereign states. I think I won't surprise you with the statement that this view is very distant from our understanding of the Summit for Democracy process. According to our interpretation, through anchoring the topic of democracy with a unique high-level format on the international political agenda, the Summit for Democracy provides a rare opportunity of inward-looking stock-taking for democracies throughout the globe, irres irrespectively whether these democracies are or aren't part of the Western world. The Summit for Democracy process offers involved countries and civil societies an opportunity to strengthen their democratic identity, an opportunity to celebrate for a moment that in some form we are all democracies and we are part of the same family. And in this respect, the Summit for Democracy strengthened diplomatic ties between countries and it provides both participants and citizens and civil societies of non-participating states the impulse to reflect on the democratic deficiencies of their own political systems and improve their own political systems. So in my eyes, the Summit for Democracy creates a global framework for democracies to inward looking, inward looking critical reflection and self-correction. And this self-reflection and self-correction will be also at the heart of our two-day panel discussion, while we will investigate the political and legal frameworks offered by certain EU and NATO member states for their own civil societies. I am more than delighted to introduce you our today distinguished speakers. In alphabetical order, Professor Adam Bodnar, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw. Luisa Slavkova, Executive Director of Sofia Platform, one of Bulgaria's key community development NGO. Marta Pardavi, Co-Chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. And last but not least, Melissa Hooper, Senior Advisor at the United States Agency for International Developments. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for accepting our invitation and for sharing your thoughts with our audience today. And uh, in the spirit of self-reflection and self-correction, I would like uh, to suggest starting with two rounds of speaker contributions. In the first round, I would like to kindly ask you to provide us an overview about the extent of illiberal or authoritarian challenges to democracy and their particular impact on civic activism and civil society in Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, and also in a broader regional comparison. In short, please answer the question, what's the impact of shrinking spaces on civil society in the country you know the best? While in the second round, I would like to kindly ask you to identify lessons learned and best practices, and also formulate policy recommendations that might help the grassroots civil society, the international donor community, or European and transatlantic partners to develop better policies to counter state-induced shrinking spaces in Central Europe. Concerning the housekeeping rules, I would like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that this event is recorded 
and will be available online at the YouTube channel of the German Marshall Fund. We will start with the two speaker rounds, followed by an approximately 30 minutes long Q&A at the end of the event. And I would like to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to use either the Q&A or the chat function of Zoom to submit your questions or comments to our panelists. And uh, having said that, I would like to turn to Luisa, because in many respects, I think as a superficial observer, uh, shrinking spaces in Bulgaria have different drivers than in Hungary and Poland. In Hungary and Poland, illiberal parties, which are dominating the political scene, abuse the institutions of strong states to proceed with their authoritarian agenda. At least at the first sight, the political landscape of Bulgaria appears to be much more pluralistic and the state itself potentially weaker. Uh, what are then the root causes of illiberal developments and shrinking spaces in the country? And how do they impact civil society, civic activism? The floor is yours. Over to you, Luisa. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you once again for, for having me um, join this, uh, this stellar group of friends um, across Europe and in the United States. Um, on the one hand, I'm happy. On the other hand, I'm thinking, um, all right. So uh, it's the it's the three of us countries in the same in the same basket, um, and I'm somehow happy to, to 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 know that there is actually finally some recognition that Bulgaria is on a way of becoming another troublemaker in in Central and Eastern Eastern Europe. And why is that the case? So um, Bulgaria, I would say, unlike probably. Poland, um, a lesson like uh, uh, Hungary, is a country that has a very different relationship to Russia. And this has always been the case, I mean, always uh, in the last 75 plus, uh, plus, plus years. And these positive sentiments toward Russia have made Russian meddling in this country a very easy game uh, to a point where um, people are you know, so trusting of anything that comes from Russia that it's just very difficult to deal deal with that, and it doesn't only go in in hand in hand with the sentiment we're all you know Slavic people or we're all Orthodox. It's really about this grand narrative um, uh, based on which um, um, we construct our national identity. It's basically you know we hate the Ottomans uh, or or the Turks, and we love the Russians because they came and liberated us from from the Ottomans. And not only that, but they also came and liberated us in 44 from uh, Nazi Germany. But we forget that we actually, uh, you know, the country joined uh, Nazi Germany in the Second World War. So uh, we were on, to, on the two opposing sides. So that's just a short excursion in, in, in history. But all of that um, gets us to a point where um, the, the levels of penetration of Russian meddling here go very deep. They go into business interests and they go into a lot of different different outlets and make it very dif difficult um for, for you know all the democratic forces to actually to actually counter counter that so this is one major issue that i think is becoming more and more um visible also now since the beginning of the war in ukraine and i think this was a even though i mean with or without the zeit and um uh, note of the german chancellor the time in here with the beginning of the war felt a little bit like um, the beginning of the 90s. It did feel like a watershed moment where it started becoming very clearly who supports whom and for what reasons. And this is also the moment when it became very clear how much of a um, still work needs to be done in order to unpack all these myths um, on which we're, we're uh, you know, grounding our our identity here as as Bulgarians. So that's I think one one big basket. The other one um, is obviously the various anti democratic homegrown, but also part of them uh, uh, Russia supported political forces. We are headed to the fifth election cycle in the last two years now on um, on April the second. And one of those parties that are um, openly pro-Russian, um, it has a big chance of becoming um, the third strongest party um, in the in the upcoming parliament. And that's a very fragmented, or will be a very fragmented uh, parliament. Um, when you look at how much uh, speaking time uh, representatives of that party get, 
both in national uh, 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 television and radio, but also within parliament, um, they're dominating. They're dominating. They're dominating the discourse. They're dominating messages, um, and uh, that does have uh, obviously its its impact. Next to parties like that, we also have um, anti-systemic president who is in his uh, second round. So uh, uh, it's very difficult at some point to distinct what is um, external uh, meddling or threat and what is a homegrown, or where does the you know where does the um, the border the border run? So that's on 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 that end. But I always, when I get to be asked this question, I always also like to talk about the very um, you know the the the. the where the, the area where we can do some soul searching. So what is our own fault and what are the things that we um, could be doing better, could have done better in order to, to prevent shrinking um, uh, civil society space. And one of the things that I always look into is this um, extreme centralization. And I think uh, both you and Marta will, uh, will agree with me, even though I don't see you nodding, that it's for civil society, um, it's devastating to be centralized in the capital. And so in countries that where the capitals are prevalent, where resources are, are, are focused, where civil society is there, um, there is uh, hardly anything left outside of the capital. And this is a dangerous tendency. And I think it has to do with the way transition has been kickstarted in the region. And since we're broadly speaking also within the framework of uh, um, of democracy in the world, I think this is a, an important lesson to keep in mind that uh, centralization, when it comes to supporting democracy development, is not a good is not a good um, good strategy. Um, I will uh, probably just round it up, thinking of dynamics that bring that contribute to shrinking civil society space. Money is never, uh, I mean, we're all tired of talking about the civil society needs money, but I think uh, it's never wrong to mention um, why that's so important. And I have um, a couple of numbers in my mind of recent studies we have done. One is focused in these peripheral areas that show that um, civic actors outside uh, the big cities uh, live off of 5,000 euros budget per year. And how do we want them to do good quality civic work? This is just um, just not um, just not um, possible. And to maybe um, uh, drop a last a last uh, pin, um, it is the genuine lack of understanding in a society like the Bulgarian what is what and who is civil society. What is, what is its contribution? Why is it important? Uh, who is in it? Who is not in, in, in it? Um, how is it different from the state? Um, uh, am I civil society? Am I not? And I'm thinking there too, um, in light of a broader uh, a conversation about democracy in the world, um, understanding what a, what a civil society is and why it's important, how we all belong to it um, is just crucial uh, for its survival. Uh, next to funds and the other things. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa, for this excellent points. And uh, I am really now looking forward to ask the question in the second round, where would you draw the line between civil society and not necessarily civic representatives of, uh, of this space? But uh, but I think we have to wait for the second round with, uh, with this question. And I would like to turn to Marta because uh, the legislative and political framework to limit and suppress civil society is obviously the most developed in Hungary among all of the EU member states. And you have been at the forefront of civil opposition to autocratization now over the past decade in the country. How do you see the sustainability of civic activism in Hungary? And how do you see the impact of the political and legal environment on civil society, civil society organizations, and civic activism in general? Over to you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here at this side event, and I must say that um, um, you probably all heard that the Hungarian government was not invited to the official um, summit for democracy it is all the more important for civil society organizations to be taking part in equally important civil society organized events and not only civil society organized events, because um, as, as I'm sure this panel will also explore, there is a lot of 
a lot of strength, a lot of core strength out there that can benefit from support. Louisa was uh, talking about a lot of very important features, and that makes me think to paraphrase a, a well known sentence that basically all healthy, vibrant civic spaces are alike, but unhealthy shrinking spaces are all shrinking in their own way. And there is, uh, of course, um, a lot of similarities between the three of our countries, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Poland, but there are stark differences. And sadly, I have to say that Hungary comes out as the worst, probably, certainly within the European Union. Uh, I'm sure that people participating in these events today and, and this week around the world will talk about a lot of, of problems with democracy, but it is quite notable that within probably the most sophisticated or more, most well-equipped space for democracy, the European Union, Hungary is still so badly performing that um, the, even the European Parliament has termed it a hybrid regime of electoral autocracy. And this, of course, also impacts on civil society as, as one of the most important actors uh, in a, in a, beyond the institutional actors in a democracy. Um, what, what can we say um, in terms of, of what this means for Hungarian civil society? I think it's been quite well documented and most of the time Hungary is mentioned as one of the key bad practices, bad examples. Civicus, um, global civil society organization that monitors uh, civil space around the world has termed Hungary a closed space. Others call it various ways, but still within this space, there is a lot of, of, of important um, activists and groups of civil society, um, informal groups or formal groups, which do, um, valuable work, which basically fill gaps. The other gaps are being filled very often by journalists. And the gaps are created by the, basically the facade of the separation of powers. Of course, these institutions exist, but by now you can, you can see how the Hungarian executive power is dominating the other two, the legislative and the judiciary, and is trying to ensure that they would be subservient um, loyal executioners of the executive power as well. And so civil society as and journalists, um, independent uh, journalists would have an extremely important role to hold government accountable in a, at a time when institutions are unable or unwilling to do so. And we see a lot of this happening. And I think this is one of the reasons why there is uh, a lot of pressure on Hungarian independent civil society organizations and actors because they want to do their job and they're quite um, uh, professional, I think, in, in many ways, despite the years of hardship. Maybe that has given us uh, a way to uh, uh, some form of resilience, but certainly I think we can see uh, how certain types of organizations are becoming stronger. But coming back to Louisa's point, this is happening at a, in a space where, of course, the overall number of civil society organizations that can and will hold government institutions accountable, that will, that will stand up, advocate for human rights protection, their number is shrinking. And particularly, we've seen this, how they're starting to get concentrated, as Louisa, you said, around the capitals, all the more important to work together both in local and national networks and to bring resources and support, skills, knowledge, contacts to local actors so that people don't feel like they are the only ones out there, but they all feel that they're a part of a community. And this feeling of community, I think, is something that is absolutely being under attack. Um, Luisa mentioned the, the funding to civil society, and that is perhaps an indicator to see how the landscape works. Um, in Hungary in 2021, the income of civil society organizations, all types of civil society organizations, was quite a lot. It was 2.8 billion euros. That's a lot of money. But 35% of these organizations had tiny, minuscule budgets. 
less than $2,000 per year. And um, 44% of the funding to civil, to civil society organizations comes from public funds, both the European structural funds, EU funds, and also Hungarian central or local government funds. So the, the, this is not the imprint of a healthy landscape where there is of course going, growing, crowdfunding, growing initiatives, growing, giving, if they can afford it by individual citizens, but still dependence on state structures is very dominant. And this of course will determine how vocal actors are. And we hear this quite a lot when the Hungarian government actually talks about civil society as a good thing, even just a few weeks ago, it signed on to a statement of, um, of all the 27 EU member states that called for protecting civil society and human rights defenders specifically. But when it comes to, to actually pointing out flaws, corruption, um, deficiencies in democracy and the rule of law in human rights protection, then the government will often say, this is not real civil society. And this is where I think we see quite a lot of similarities with other regions of the world, other geographies, where those groups that do advocacy, that stand up, give um, a voice to people in their groups who are marginalized, who are, who are pushed to the corners, will face quite a lot of backlash. Whereas those that provide services, very key services and often very crumbling um, public sectors such as education, healthcare, will be even provided government funds or, or national funds as long as they don't speak about it in practice. And this is, I think, what becomes a very characteristic trait in Hungary. If you do advocacy, if you're effective, if you can garner um, support for your work, if you can capture uh, solidarity with others, then this probably will result in some side, some kind of, of repercussion. This is what um, we've seen in just in the past few months, affecting teachers who are protesting alongside with parents and students for improvement of public education. We've also seen this um, crackdown on doctors whose um, uh, membership in, in, the, in the medical chamber, the national interest representation body is being um, uh, turned into purely a voluntary membership trying to weaken their structures. And so this is the, the, the I think the, the thing that makes Hungarian shrinking civic space very um, different that this dominance of power actually takes away space through legislative means, through policies, through smear campaigns, trying to ensure that people wouldn't have um, the desire to engage in public affairs. And still we see pushback and there's a lot of things to, to be done to support that. And I'm happy to talk about that later. Thank you so much, Marta, for this nuanced take. I collected a lot of follow-up questions, but I think I will keep them in storage for uh, for the Q and A. Uh, and and I would like to turn to to Adam, because I think it's fair to say that the Polish civil society performed a kind of civic opposition to to illiberal and authoritarian tendencies over the past seven to eight years, which which appeared to be unprecedented in a Central European context. Uh, nonetheless, if we take a look on this track record of, uh, of protest, I think one can easily come to the conclusion that civic opposition was strong, but not decisive. And uh, I'm very much interested whether you agree with that conclusion, that civic opposition was strong, but not decisive. And I also would like to ask you, uh, to give us an overview, how have policies of the PIS governments shaped the Polish civic activism and civil society since 2015? And, uh, and in general, how would you draw the balance of, uh, of the performance of the civic opposition? Over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for uh, invitation. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to participate in this uh, extremely important uh, panel. Uh, I think I would agree with you saying that this uh, uh, civic opposition and its emergence uh, was important to uh, stop certain changes or at least freeze them as of now 
but the but it was not decisive uh, in terms of uh, let's say rejecting a certain model that is proposed by the law and justice uh, government. And I think it is uh, important to say that we are right now waiting for parliamentary elections. Uh, we do hope that those elections uh, will bring an important change in the Polish uh, democracy, that it would mean that we are going to come back to the, uh, to the family of uh, typical democratic modern states. But it is not really certain. It is not certain whether it will happen and to what extent this civic opposition uh, supported uh, and its effort that was uh, amplified by the actions of the European Union, uh, especially by the European Commission and the Court of Justice of the EU, uh, also by, uh, by judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, whether all of this is enough to sustain uh, and to keep the democratic uh, model uh, in, in Poland. Because I can imagine that if uh, elections are won by the law and justice once again, then it would mean continuation of reforms, just in the same way as it is done in Hungary, but maybe even in some, with some respects, in more radical and uh, brutal way. Uh, so just to give you an idea, like from time to time, we see the, uh, uh, that one of the parties is flagging the idea of passing the foreign agents law, basically the same law as it was recently proposed in Georgia. Uh, so this is, you know, in the pipeline somewhere. Uh, you can imagine also that what may happen with the Association of Independent Prosecutors uh, after uh, if elections are won by Mr. Ziobro once again, by the Minister of Justice uh, once again, I can imagine that those prosecutors would not have an easy life uh, after uh, a new opening, a new chapter uh, allowing for, for some further legislative changes or what to do with all those judges that dissent, uh, is European Union, uh, is the European Union, is the European Court of Human Rights strong enough to protect them for another couple of years? I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm not sure whether they will have enough of energy uh, to defend themselves against this anti-democratic uh, tide. So, so my feeling is that right now we are in this very important moment of elections uh, that, you know, we kind of, on the one hand, we do our work, uh, we try to uh, uh, to identify basic threats to the uh, to the democracy and also to the uh, to elections, but at the same time we are not really certain what may happen afterwards and to what extent uh, our uh, to what extent this uh, civil society may su survive and to what extent it might be uh, still independent. I think there are some interesting peculiarities of the Polish uh, situation that I would like to indicate. I think that what we observe now is that government is funding a lot of gongos. Uh, so, you know, I remember days when I was collaborating with activists from Azerbaijan. Uh, I knew this notion gongo, and I would never think that we would have that many of them, uh, and that they are providing not only uh, support to governmental policies, but I'm not really sure to what extent they would support uh, the ruling party in the context of uh, upcoming elections and the uh, parliamentary campaign. Uh, I see also that uh, you have a lot of media that are subordinated to the government and the space for the independent debate is very much uh, limited. What is also quite uh, uh, interesting is that there are leaders of uh, NGOs or there are, there are organizations that are dealing with some specific issues that are simply a uh, victim of constant targeting by the state. Uh, and, and of course, it is not like this that every day a government is attacking, let's say, LGBT plus rights organizations or LGBT plus organizations, but it goes in waves depending on the political uh, climate, political uh, uh, expectations, or uh, some instrumentalization of of certain topics for the purposes of the political campaigning. Uh, there are some organizations that are especially right now uh, supporting refugees uh, and migrants at the Polish-Belarusian border that are subject of, uh, uh, of some uh, um, popular and strong moves by the government. Can you imagine that even uh, activists of the club of Catholic intelligentsia have been targeted uh, by uh, actions by some uh, border guards because of their activity on the uh, on the border. I think what is uh, interesting that this targeting is not just by uh, government, but you may see uh, uh, use of the prosecutor's office 
uh, you may see use of slab uh, procedures. So, uh, but but interestingly, you know, when we are thinking about slab, the major perpetrator of slabs is the state or the state-owned companies, and not some you know private corporations. So sometimes when we are having this discussion uh, within the uh, uh, European Commission concerning the future of slabs, we see that you know here the perpetrator is the state or the state agencies and not some private in, individuals like in some other uh, countries. And so sometimes I think the EU uh, uh, institutions do not understand that it is the state that might use that kind of techniques in order to disable the activity of uh, uh, organizations. Uh, another problem is that some organizations are not only monitoring bodies, uh, watchdogs, uh, but they are also service providers. If you are the organization dealing with rights of persons with disabilities, it is not the easy task for you to be independent. If uh, the fate of your uh, of the people you are taking care of depends on uh, the funding by the state, uh, so uh, so in my opinion, it is one of those ways uh, by which the state is uh, destabilizing the civil society sector in its independence by uh, basically sharing the money in such a way as that those independent ones do not have easy access. To the money, so the concept of shrinking space uh, appears uh, uh, here. I think that there is one interesting positive point, maybe if I may. Uh, I think it is the use of new technologies uh, and some, let's say, innovation in terms of civic activism, as well as crowdfunding. Uh, so ho uh, hopefully, uh, Polish state is pretty big, 38 million. Uh, which uh, gives an opportunity for interesting crowdfunding initiatives, including funding of some new media initiatives. Uh, and but but what I would like, what I would expect, uh, I think, is that those uh, entities should have uh, more access to some uh, independent uh, uh, funding because uh, you know crowd crowdfunding is a good as a resource. But you have to promote it uh, properly. You have to pro uh, teach people. You have to instruct people. You have to encourage people how to uh, basically support the independent civic activism with, you know, with their uh, money that is funded in those uh, activities. So, as of first, let's say interaction, you know, that is uh, everything. Or like, would, what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, Melissa, you have been working both on Central Europe and its neighboring regions, uh, and, and you have decades of experience in human rights advocacy and also democracy assistance. So I think you are particularly well positioned to draw conclusions based on regional comparison, because all of us are from Central and Eastern Europe, and I think in that regard, not necessarily objective while we are coming uh, to our personal conclusions. But how do you see the threat level to civil society in Central Europe? And I would be really interested whether you can identify any special characteristics of illiberal challenges to democracy and civil society in this region, which are not necessarily present in other ones. Maybe speak about the former Eastern Partnership countries or potentially about, uh, about the Western Balkans. So I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. And um, I'm excited that I can participate in this stellar panel. Um, and so thanks for the invitation. Um, in terms of talking about uh, this particular region, um, I would say that the erosion of democratic institutions in this region is, you know, part of a, a global trend. Um, so there isn't, you know, this isn't just happening in this region. Um, the Varieties of Democracy Institute uh, report for this year um, has said that advances made in global democracy over the last 35 years have been eroded. So we're back at the levels of democracy globally that we were at in 1986. And so I want to point out that you know it isn't just this region, but I also want to note that the U.S. is not immune, and this is happening in the U.S. as well, that we're, you know, really seeing this globally. Um, but I do want to note that for this region, um, I think that the situations in particular of Hungary and Poland are distinctive uh, because they have been on the front end of a particular trend. And I think that trend is um, demonstrating how, demonstrating a model for how to be, um, a participant in democratic in-groups 
um, you know, democratic communities, but then also um, taking action against institutions and so presenting, you know, specific um, challenges, challenges to judicial independence, rule of law, limiting checks and balances, but then being able to benefit from uh, receiving the funding and clout that come along with being part of the community that is, you know, called the democratic community. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, we've seen that this has been taken as a model and um, has been uh, adopted or, um, you know, aspects of it have been uh, attempted by other governments, and that's both within the EU, um, but now there was a mention of Georgia, you know, we're seeing um, uh, attempts uh, at modifying the, ju the judiciary in Georgia that I think could be seen as similar to what we've seen in this region. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that over the weekend you have Israelis protesting, um, saying that they don't want their judiciary to look like Poland's. Um, and the Polish government, uh, at, you know, indicating their indications that the Polish government did consult with the Israeli government. So you have models here um, of how to have it both ways um, that I think um, are, are presenting, um, you know, challenges for those, for NATO, for the EU, for democratic communities, and not just for the countries that they're in. I think the second characteristic that I'd identify is that um, these, uh, the strategies that have been used to uh, undermine institutions have been going on for a long period of time without a really fulsome response. Um, that has, uh, you know, while there have been, there's been the ability to curtail pieces and, and, and particular strategies that really we've seen damage to institutions over time. And so now I think that the democratic community is at a point where um, while, uh, let's say, the EU and the US want to work with these governments and work with the people in um, con these countries to try to bring institutions back toward democracy, there's not a clear path for how to do that. And in particular, I think it's hard to see how to do that um, using democratic methods, since some of the strategies used were not aligned with democratic action. Um, and so trying to bring these institutions back to on a democratic footing um, pre is presenting significant challenges. Um, I think in addition to the entrenched nature of the policies that makes the path towards a more democratic footing clear, we're also seeing um, some uh, the threat to regional security that these policies present being drawn in a much more clear and uh, and stark picture. Um, and I think that that's been presented in particular in response to the full-scale invasion and war in Ukraine. Um, so, you know, in the past, I think that there were concerns about, let's say, you know, the, the move of the International Investment Bank um, to Budapest and the, the related um, Schengen visa allowance um, that there ha have been some concerns, concerns presented about, you know, blocking um, negotiations between Ukraine and NATO. But there has been this idea that, um, well, we need to be cautious in thinking about how to, uh, how to respond to this within a democratic community. Um, but now that the disunity that this um, presents and draws within the EU and within NATO, I think, has um, has become more of a, uh, increased the alert level. Um, and so that there is um, an, a greater interest in developing responses. But again, because of the entrenched nature, the, the landscape is much more complicated. Um, I would also point out that statements by governments in, in the EU that they will not use democratic processes to, for example, select judges um, should be also seen as um, having a, having a similar uh, threat level um, within, within democratic communities. Um, and so I will just say that on top of all of this, um, you know, where we have a situation where institutions have been eroded and um, we're now seeing the, the threat presented 
by that much more clearly, but the, um, the response is much more complicated and difficult to identify and the path forward is more complicated and difficult to identify. Um, there is, I think, a more, we've seen a more proactive stance by the EU and by the US in particular, but on top of it, civil society groups are, who could maybe be a natural partner um, in moving more toward a democratic path are exhausted um, and demoralized and, and you know, have been in some cases uh, working in support of democracy for eight years, 10 years, um, you know, trying to respond to these strategies. And so we're in a situation where um, a more proactive response might be possible, but there's a bit less unity and there's a bit less strength on the part of civil society. And then of course, you know, civil society groups are also on the forefront of responding to um, the uh, influx of maybe Ukrainian refugees, other newcomers in response to the war. So they're now operating on so many different fronts that their, um, their focus is also diverted. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Melissa. You provided me a lot of ammunition to the to the Q and A uh, in the form of follow up questions. But I think now it's time to turn the table uh, in the sense that you identified a lot of challenges and key characteristics of shrinking spaces in the respective countries and uh, and in the broader Central and Eastern European region. So my question in the second round would be, what would be your key recommendations? or potentially the, the lessons learned, what you would like to, to highlight, which can contribute to more impactful and, uh, and potentially more effective responses to the shrinking spaces phenomenon in the future. So I don't know if you could just formulate three to five key points, key recommendations, key takeaways with practical policy-based implications addressed either to the civil societies themselves in the region or the broader donor community or potentially because as you underlined it we are speaking about state induced shrinking spaces where excuse for using that word but the main perpetrator are still the states so against that background uh, addressing the, the transatlantic or the european community with your recommendations then what would be your policy recommendations? And I know it's it's not fair, uh, not giving enough space to uh, to consider the response, but I would like to suggest just to go into uh, in reverse order and potentially ask Melissa uh, to share her recommendations with us. You have the floor. Okay, thank you, um, So I think, yeah, this is maybe hopefully the the, the more fun and interesting part. Um, I will, so I would say that um, one aspect of, of what I've seen is that we focus, and I say we because I was so much, I was part of civil society for so many years um, and I have participated in this. So I think we focus very much on the violations that we've seen, on the threats that they present, on exposing corruption and identifying um, corruption in institutions. Um, but I think that, you know, we've seen research that over time, what that can do is it can increase the sense of our communities and of civil of our societies that um, they don't want to trust institutions. It, it can increase this level of distrust. It can decrease trust. Um, and so I think it's important that we focus much more on developing a vision for what we want the future to look like um, and developing you know, a vision for what democratic institutions look like and what we're driving forward. Um, Marta um, you know, pointed out this sense of, of needing to build community. And I think that that's really um, a major recommendation that I would have as well. Um, it's about you know, trying to create these connections between people. Um, and so those can, can hopefully pre-exist um, the difficulties that we're trying to combat. Um, I will say that Tim Snyder in his very thin book called On Tyranny has a very simple um, point, which is talk to strangers. 
And so I think that that is pointing us toward, um, you know, building, uh, building links to each other and building links across different, different types of communities. So that is, you know, that points to a second um, strategy was, which is essentially getting outside of the bubble. Um, and all of our panelists have talked about this today, but it's about um, reaching out to those that are in smaller communities or outside capitals um, and trying to identify what is concerning to them and how these large issues of rule of law, um, democracy play out in their lives. Um, and I would say that, you know, this has been, this is something that has been done in this region, I think very well, but I think it's also illustrative to look at some other examples. You know, this is happening in Russia, in a place that is very closed and very difficult to operate in, but there have been movements around uh, trash disposal, around healthcare. Um, and, you know, there continue to be very local communities um, and local movements that will bring people together and at least help um, forge some bond and connection to show people that they are, you know, part of something larger than themselves. Um, I will say also that, you know, what we've seen at USAID is work with youth has uh, started to show some, um, some forward movement in doing things like, you um, using uh, groups that are focused on music, that they, um, they've used their music activism to communicate to larger groups of people, you know, that they are in support of uh, changes in uh, climate policy or changes in, you know, environmental policies. Um, we've also seen in Moldova that there are groups that are training youth as local correspondents, so they're connecting them to journalism, and then young people are then reporting on issues that are important to them, but then they are also able to reach out to other young people that are, you know, of their age and are also interested in what's going on in their community. Um, I will say, turning to the needs of activists themselves, that uh, the donor community needs to recognize that activists need respite and community as well as to do their work. So in short, I think that activists need funding to take a break as well as to do their work and they need long-term funding such that they can plan and, and have a strategy and so they're not just responding to what's happening right now. Um, in addition, I will, I will point out that we need to organize activists not only within countries but across borders since authoritarian learning happens across borders, corrupt funding crosses borders, it's important that we have those links set so that when strategies occur, that there can be a response that's cross borders. Um, you know, in particular, there was a mention of foreign agent laws. And I know that um, Hungarian activists consulted Russian activists when foreign agent type laws were passed in Hungary. You know, now we're seeing in Georgia and Bosnia um, that there are attempts at these laws. And I think that if we, you know, have interwoven communities built, that there can be responses that can be much more quickly um, developed. Um, the USAID's Anti-Corruption Task Force is also trying to start now pilot programming that will connect networks um, of activists that are investigating illicit financing, for example, for political parties across borders to help expose these to help expose these sources. Um, and I think in general, it is important to develop more skills that are tracking these finances um, within civil society. And so I think um, this was said earlier as well, it's not just investigative journalism, journalists that are doing this work. And so then finally, I'll wrap up by saying that I think it's important for governments themselves to collaborate. Um, that there should be joint strategies in support of uh, democracy. So, for example, you know, the EU and the US are both uh, putting more funding into this region, but I think that the two need to be coordinating what the goals are of the funding so that the support is all focused around a common set of goals. Um, and I also think that it could be better linked to the policy uh, to policy support and the, the pro-democratic policies that the EU and the US want to see in this region. Um, so for example, you know, 
when the EU is developing its strategies for budget conditionality, that it can be working with the US to ensure that um, as the two are, um, are, develop, are thinking about how they want to move toward more democratic institutions, that they are coordinating um, the strategies both diplomatically through assistance funding um, and just through their um, through their other methods of support to civil society. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa, for these excellent points and recommendations. And uh, working for a transatlantic organization who is in partnership with both US-based and European-based uh, institutions and, uh, and partners, I think I can just echo your words that coordination in the transatlantic space, how to address all of these phenomena would be crucial. And uh, practically, this is a point for a construction site where we have seen the, the smallest amount of developments over the past couple of years. Because I would like to reiterate what you mentioned and what Mar Marta mentioned, that uh, over the past two years, there was a very significant development in providing support to Central and Eastern European civil society, both from the US and, and the European end, which is a great development. But seeing these funding streams being coordinated is potentially the, the next step uh, ahead. Uh, but thank you so much again. And uh, I would like to turn to you, Adam. What would be your recommendations, either from a Polish perspective or even from a from a, ro a broader regional perspective and, and comparison. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be uh, quite frank with you, uh, because you know we have this saying that you know that we can cure the patient. We we'll, uh, we may invest uh, the best uh, possible medicines into curing the patient, but in the meantime the patient dies. Uh, so when I hear about, you know, uh, the need for coordination, need to prioritize different things, need to seek for the better cooperation with the EU institutions and so on and so on, then I ask the question, okay, but we are having elections in half a year, and is there any money available for NGOs that would be independent, that would be strong to make proper electoral control uh, right now? Is there a money for, uh, is there a funding provided that may... Uh, counterbalance uh, the use of the Gongos money uh, for uh, electoral uh, purposes. Uh, is there a, a possibility to provide good money for some startup organizations uh, that would be uh, important? And of course, I understand all those policies and how it takes so much time. But uh, look, uh, we are having 2023, and I think the recent elections in Hungary was a big warning, you know, what may happen if NGOs are not supported, if uh, if there is no proper, uh, if there is no proper uh, support to the watchdog and monitoring organizations, and um, uh, uh, so, so basically, I think you know uh, there is no time, kind of, of reflecting that what rule of law, media freedom, LGBT plus rights, and women's rights are important, uh, you know, or uh, migrants' rights are important. You know, there are uh, there is no. I think need for a bigger reflection that you need to invest into individual leaders. You need to provide them with money to, to protect themselves against slaps. You need to, uh, to give money uh, to, uh, uh, to provide for a comprehensive uh, activities concerning awareness raising uh, or concerning uh, uh, litigation. And of course that uh, as an answer, you can indicate to me a number of projects that are implemented. I don't question them. I know that they are implementing them, but the question is to what extent they are really effective and to what extent they are really making a change uh, in, uh, in my country. Uh, because my feeling is that they are not making change. You know, if I see such organizations like my favorite organizations, Tour de Constitucia, Tour de Constitution, uh, which is organizing, you know, meetings to promote the constitution in a number of uh, cities around Poland, and they do not have even, you know, uh, some basic money because there is no basically available funding pool for that kind of organizations because maybe it is i don't know too political or maybe that is too broad or maybe uh, too general or maybe it is not about shaping identity of some future leaders then basically i have a uh, i have a problem with this so so in my opinion uh, uh, there is simply uh, not enough money for typical uh, democratic promotion and watchdog uh, organizations. Second, if this money go is, it is available only to those big players that are always here, 
uh, but it seems to me that they are not, uh, they are of course important. I don't want to question uh, their, uh, their role, but it seems to me that we need much, much uh, more here. The second point I would like to mention is that we need constantly uh, investment into the legal education. Uh, surprise, surprise, but most of the money for this goes from the Norwegian funds, not from the US or the EU. Uh, so still the Norwegian funds is the better source of uh, 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 of, of funding than uh, anything else. And it seems to me that Norwegians are much more flexible in terms of their understanding and their approach. And the fourth point I would like to say is uh, that we observe right now the process of so-called uh, media deserts. Uh, by media deserts, I understand some regions, some uh, cities in which simply you do, where you do not have a free press. And of course, uh, I don't claim that uh, that funding should be for new media, but you know it's not that bad idea. But I think there are certain NGOs, as Martha said, that are at least trying to supplement this role that is uh, that is usually played by uh, by some local media. Uh, so at least uh, basically uh, supporting those uh, initiatives uh, that are uh, investing into the local uh, into the local. Uh, oversight local watchdog uh, activities. Recently, I have published my op-ed uh, in a, a magazine which is called Swedish Debate in the context of the Swedish presidency. And basically, I claimed that it should be the point of reflection for the whole European Union to what extent some kind of a you know media freedom support fund should be generated at the EU level, uh, thanks to which different media organizations, especially small ones, should have access to independent EU, uh, EU money. Right now, it seems to me they don't have any access uh, whatsoever, and we observe the process of dying of different local uh, uh, local offices. I think it is extremely uh, important, and it seems to even to me even, that it is even much more important than adoption of the European Media Freedom Act. Uh, my feeling is that even if this European Media 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 Freedom Act would be adopted, then it would not change a lot. Uh, because such guys like uh, Polish leaders or Hungarian leaders would find a way how to circumvent some uh, general uh, obligations stemming from this uh, from this act. But funding for local uh, media could be important for those local leaders and local uh, journalists to survive and to provide with the watchdog activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, for this excellent and straightforward uh, recommendations. And I think also at the beginning, we agreed that the dynamics in every single individual country behind the shrinking spaces are different. Uh, I think your recommendations fit one in one to Hungary as well. So against that background, it, it was an important argument that uh, we still have very similar dynamics and, uh, and challenges in at least in these two countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, before I would give the floor to, to Marta, I would like to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to, to submit your question in the Q&A function. Uh, and, uh, and then having said that, Marta, you have the floor and we are looking forward to your recommendations regarding Hungary or European or transatlantic uh, policies, how to address shrinking spaces in the region. Over to you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the others also for, for the recommendations made so far. Um, I, of course, cannot uh, argue with the, with the call for more resources, um, more, more funding in particular. But I think also we have to think of flexible funding and stable funding too. This is um, at a time when, when um, when there's a lot of unpredictability in any crisis, be it COVID, the war, or the political landscape, people will look for stability. And if a civil society uh, sector can offer that, I think that's a, that's a great gain. So stability for people in the sector, uh, so that it's, it's the kind of place you want to continue to go to work at that you want to continue to engage because it's good for you and it's 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 valued valued by your community i think that's very important to invest into this means core funding and also flexible funding and and funding for small organizations that uh, that is accessible without being uh, overly um, overly bureaucratic 
also another aspect I think of the stability is that despite the 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 sometimes dire circumstances that an organization or a sector faces, we're still part of a larger space, uh, European space in the European Union, but also a global space. And so it's the conversation, the focus should not always be on shrinking civic space. And I'm saying this, of course, in this particular webinar, but to include organizations and sectors in global debates, in global learning, is really important so that we don't only talk about democratic decline and fighting it, but we also talk about the other major challenges and for organizations and sectors to be able to keep up with this kind of discussions, with these policy debates, I think it's very important. It helps you to retain good people in the sector and it also helps you prepare for the future. And this perhaps is not done locally, but it's done cross transnationally. And so it's, it's, I think, an important aspect to, to engage um, even, even sectors, spaces, which seem to be at risk in these kind of debates. Transnational skills and knowledge building is, is very, very important. Solidarity is, of course, another thing. And this, I'm coming from a Helsinki organization, right? The whole idea that, this, that brought this civic movement uh, into place was that there is uh, great value in international cross-border solidarity, both horizontally and also vertically. So the, the fact, particularly in the, in the European Union, but also transit in, in, in the transatlantic space, that something that happens in Bulgaria, like a foreign agent law uh, being proposed, might have an impact and will certainly have an impact in certain countries. And that spillover effect, particularly in the EU single market, will can, can spread very, very fast. We talk about um, uh, Georgia, we talk about Bosnia, but let's not forget that the European Union is also considering some form of foreign agent, foreign funded designation. We also have to push back on this at EU level. And that requires certainly transnational cross-border solidarity action. But the support can also translate into financial support. So um, as, and this is perhaps easier said than done, even in the European Union, but something to strive towards is cross-border support with the benefits, the tax and other incentives attached. This is really important. How can we how can we have a common space for values if physical borders still step in the way of cross-border support for, for these values? So let's, let's allow individuals and let's allow companies to, to easily donate in a cross-border manner, um, benefiting from, from various um, you know, favorable schemes under tax laws. This is one area where the European Union should absolutely um, move forward. And another thing that I wanted to talk about is, is, is a very concrete issue, but it is, seems to be a, a big um, bottleneck. Most of the funding, be it private or public, local or, or international, will stop where real support is needed to those who are under attack i.e. legal costs. You will need lawyers to help people who are being attacked. You will need lawyers to, to defend um, institutions in courts, be they dem uh, domestic or international courts. The European Union has made great strides now in supporting uh, learning about the use of EU tools to protect European values, um, strategic litigation is something that we can now build capacity for with EU funds, but still it stops at actually implementing this. And I think this is very important. So when we talk about coordination, as Melissa outlined, coordination of funding and policies, let's think about how we can make this happen so that not only the capacity is built for, for these kind of, of very core endeavors, but also that we will have people will do it not only when their other professional duties permit them, 
but on a regular fee paying basis, this requires funding for lawyers and litigation. And also this is something where private philanthropic donors can come in. Many are, are, are I think, grappling with the, with the idea um, uh, of, of return on investment. And we just cannot give up, right, on, on these very core notions. If we in this part of the world give up on them, how can we, how can we even consider talking to others and trying to persuade others living in a much more difficult context than, than us in Europe to, to hold on to democracy and to hold on to the spirit of democracy. And so I think private philanthropic donors also have to stick to their, to their principles, to their guns and to their funding aims in this region too. Thank you so much, Marta, for the excellent recommendations. And I especially like your point on the strategic litigation support uh, of, uh, of SURF. That from time to time, we indeed have dedicated money, which can do a lot of things, but just not fulfill its main goal, which would be providing support to strategic litigation in, in this case. Um, but I would like to give the floor, last but not least, uh, to Luisa. Uh, to share her recommendations with us, and then potentially we will still have time for one or two question rounds in the Q and A parts. Over to you, Luisa. Right, thank you. Being the last one leaves uh, uh, leaves very little that has not been said yet, um, but I think I still have a uh, list that is not um, not too short. I'll pick up on the question of funding um, simply because I think it's way too important uh, to not uh, give a few more notes to it. So Marta spoke um, at length about the importance of um, flexible funding, moving away from project funding and you know, giving uh, core funding, institutional funding, whichever way we call it, but that's really, really very, very important. And it goes also hand in hand with um, forgetting about the unwritten rule about 30% core cost, 70% project costs. It's um, the, the, the real world doesn't work this way. Civil society has to make it work this way, but actually if civil society had a choice that wouldn't go that way. So I think investing a little bit of rethinking how the funding for civil society works strategizing about it is a very important is a very important issue because you cannot sustain civil society if it's just really working with project funds um that's just not not possible paying attention to the small organizations i would even go a step further and say um there are many individuals who would like to found an organization but they're not there yet and i think here on the logistics side both nationally but also within europe and also when it comes to to donors to funding organizations it is very difficult to make that happen but a lot of activities happen in the informal sector so that's a big question how do we how do we make that 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 work and i can say that our organization has done a lot of work with um you know, informal activists who don't have a registered organization. I can tell you that legally this is very difficult. It is so much worthwhile doing it. You have such a success rate than seeing people actually take the next step and found an organization. But this very first step, um, first of all, it's very difficult to, you know, convince funders that um, this funding is important. And secondly, then the second step for, to find out to find a legal way to actually um, to actually spend it. So this whole conversation around that, I think, is important. I, I, what I also think is important is for us to take stock at. Um, I think um, Melissa started with that. If um, if we're at a point when it comes to um, uh, democratic development, uh, where we were thirty five, six years ago, I think the big question is still a little bit unanswered in terms of what could we have done differently, better, in order not to be where we're here? And I have a tendency as a political scientist to look at these key pillars of democracy. So I look at elites, I look at institutions, and I look at the people. And I'm thinking there is, there is a good reason to go back to where we started, meaning um, who is who is taking care to educate democratically our elites these days, right? So what happened with the 
old school schools of politics and all of that. Do they work? What do they do? Who is filling this gap today? Um, and if not, why not? And I know that there is a lot happening in the field of so-called political innovation that is trying to bring in diverse candidates in political parties. But I simply think in a country like Bulgaria, we're not there yet. What we need is, a, you know, in, in, in a country where we can't build a government for two years now, apparently some skills in, 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 in coalition building is, is missing, apart from the other difficulties, obviously. But I'm just saying there is a lot of good reason to look into how do we educate our elites to be democratic so that we at some point do not have an anti-systemic president, as in, 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 in our case, who puts in question all the time legitimate governments or the decisions of, of parliament. So setting precedents is very um, is very damaging for democracy, and then to repair that damage is, 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 is even uh, slower. So that's the one thing. The other thing, democratic institutions, they live of the people who work there. So again, how do we you know, educate civil servants in what a democratic institution actually means and what it means to uphold democratic standards. There again, I am not aware of who is doing that type of work and whether someone is doing it. It goes a little bit hand in hand with what Adam said at some point, election observation. I never thought in life that we'll be at a point where we here too would be talking about the necessity of having um, election observation networks. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, I hear from some colleagues who are now joining these networks here in Bulgaria for the upcoming elections, that they're looking up to Tunisia in terms of technology, because we haven't done election observation for so long in here. And then election observation currently is in, in, in this country is organized by some of the parties which in and of itself also um, makes others who join the other camps, political camps, question the whole observation because it's not done by, you know, independent organizations, but it's done by organizations affiliated with some of the parties. So here again, um, this whole kind of, you know, the classical basket of democracy development, uh, as we would call it or support uh, some, some 30 years ago, I think. It, it, it there is something to say about let's have a look at the playbook from 90 years uh, sorry 30 years ago and see what we actually did wrong there but some of the things which we have done were not bad we just stopped doing them along the along the road and we all know um why we did that then um i wanted to add a point about how difficult it is to find ways to actually support the development of local philanthropy because whatever we say, obviously, the state is one big source of funding for civil society, or should be at least, uh, not, in, not in all countries. And I mean, of course, disclaimer, uh, if there is a democratic government, that's great. If not, that's not so great. And there are gongs. Um, but there is there is great value in, and I don't really know how exactly that looks, but I don't know, organizing meetings with the biggest businesses in, in the countries, legitimate businesses, and then seeing um, uh, where does that local philanthropy come from? I mean, it should come from come from somewhere. Um, and then I'll finish off um, with the last point because um, I'm a civic educator, so I would never stop saying how important it is to, you know, going back to the third pillar, so elite institutions and the people, so uh, democracy cannot live without Democrats. Uh, I haven't really seen too many funds out there that are specifically tailored for civic education, for civic educators, for non-formal educators. Um, and I would love to start seeing um, seeing these so that we can actually start talking about a real field in civil society that does um, civic education because it goes hand in hand with um, with uh, with the health of a democracy. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, um, Luisa, and thank you all for your recommendations. I think if we sum, it, uh, sum them uh, together, then uh, there are a couple of points where the toolkit of democracy assistance in the region and civil society support could benefit from, uh, from these recommendations. But at that point, I would like to open up the, the Q&A and potentially just to uh, gather two or three questions and address them to all of you. You can freely cherry pick which one you would like to, to address them, uh, to also bring our audience uh, in uh, into the conversation in the, the last part uh, of the event. 
And potentially, I would like to start with the question of Zofia Bonta from, from Unhack Democracy. And, uh, and Zofia is asking, or practically partially also stating, that Europe has a lot to learn from our American nonprofit ecosystem that supports NGOs at any stage of their cycle, from organizational behavior to board development and administration. And how can members of European civil society advocate for this? May that be the knowledge transfer, may that be the, the reshaping and the transforming, uh, what Luisa also mentioned, practically the philanthropic ecosystem uh, in Europe and in Central and Eastern Europe, because there is obviously a huge gap and, and need uh, to make that shift. And there is obviously also a blueprint uh, from which European stakeholders uh, could learn. Um, there was also a question from uh, from Abel uh, Ezeru, and Luisa, you started your uh, your talk in the first round with a reference also to the to the external threats, and uh, and Abel is asking that obviously there are external challengers who use a different narrative, which is not democracy based, but potentially prosperity based and economic benefit based. And I think the strategic question in that regard is that how can a narrative be built around democracy, which can win the hearts and minds uh, in a confrontation or a competition with, uh, with a prosperity-based challenging narrative? And, uh, and the third question would be a summary of a couple of points you already uh, made and, and also our participants asked uh, for, for example, ECPA Berlin who made a reference that what we see with shrinking spaces is practically a boiling frog phenomenon, which, which I think is a very big structural challenge uh, for our response. Because what we have seen with regard to, uh, to the responses of the European Union over the past 10 to 12 years is that it's issue-based. It's, uh, it's react on certain very specific challenges, but obviously, lacks a strategic approach to the issue. As you already mentioned, practically all of these different aspects from shrinking spaces to illiberalism uh, adds up to a homogeneous authoritarian challenge, where ultimately at the end of the day, even the integrity of the elections are threatened. Uh, and I think in that regard, the question is on the one hand that if authoritarian challengers are playing the long game, then how can we readjust the democratic stakeholders to play the long game as well? And, uh, and potentially even adding a further question to that point, how can, we, how can we push the democratic stakeholders to not be just responsive? How can the initiative be taken? Because I think as long as we are just reacting to authoritarian challenges and practically we are playing according to the playbook, which is written by authoritarian challengers, simply based on the logic of competitive games, there is not really a big challenge to be ultimately the winner of that game. So these would be the, the three questions. If you will have two follow-up questions, then I am happy to, to ask them, but potentially would we'll just leave these three in the room and, uh, and feel free to respond any of them as you would prefer. Who would like to start? Marta, please go ahead. Thank you. Oh, there's a lot of things I'd love to react to, but uh, we don't have all the time, but, um, but there are certainly a few. So how can we make this into a strategic issue, right? Well, I think from, from, a, from a, a long years of practice um, in the European Union and in Hungary, I think we have to see how uh, the attacks on civil society attacks on judges, attacks on the media. These are not isolated incidents, but they absolutely show a pattern. We know that pattern comes from a playbook. We can absolutely see the models where this playbook is being imported from and adapted to the European space. And so once we see these incidents happening, I think 
it would be very important see, to see this as a pattern that must be stopped in its tracks and responded to. This took a very long time in the European Union to, to happen. I think we're there now. The question is, what, how do we react when it comes to, to pressures on civil society space? The EU really only has a sporadic patchwork of, of actions. A lot of organizations are calling for an EU-wide civil society strategy, something that would be, for example, built on an internal policy document, a guideline of some sorts to protect human rights defenders within the European Union. This is something that the EU already has. It binds the European institutions to protect human rights defenders and their external actions, but there's really nothing to, to match this in, inside the EU. This would be just one element of a, of a larger strategy. Larger strategy, of course, would include funding. It would include um, legal uh, instruments that protect space, that protect the ability of civil society organizations also to 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 co cooperate and move as entities in the European space. So cross border initiatives. Um, this is partly already on the on uh, in the plans for this year in in EU um, policy and lawmaking. But going beyond this, I think another aspect that Jofi Banuta brought up, but also Luisa, is about strengthening the muscle, the capacity, the capability of organizations to do things as organizations, be they formal or informal. So this kind of startup culture and fostering innovation, fostering the scaling up of organizations so that once they're on the right track, they would have the resources to develop strategies and to grow and, and to grow in a healthy way so that their resources are matched by their visions would be very, very important. And this also applies across the board to any kind of civil society organization. The hardest time sometimes is just to be a, a good workplace with good compliance, with um, you know, a, a proper um, resources in terms of finance, accounting, admin, human resources, this is very, very difficult to, to finance, but it's essential because if there's only money, as I called for it previously, for strategic litigation, then another aspect, the core of the organization of the sector will dwindle. And I think we need also support for this. So support for growth, support for stable, compliant, um, predictable operations is also key to, to safeguarding our space. Thank you so much, Marta would like to jump in with some answers to the questions. Luisa, please go ahead. Thank you. Maybe I can add just a small note on the question. Um, if that is a battle of narratives, the one is um, economic growth and the other one is democracy. How do we make an argument uh, for that? Um, it was a question about China, Russia on the one hand and then a pro-democratic narrative on the other one. That's a false di dichotomy. I think we all know that. But the, the thing is that um, people don't know, don't always know that. And so it's, um, so again, uh, pulling the, the civic educator hat, democracy is an abstract until you make it palpable. And I think this is the one thing that I also keep repeating to colleagues in, in, in my work, whether these are teachers or non-formal civic educators, we have to stop talking about democracy. We need to start young people or, or you know, adults. You need to have the practical experience of all of that because everyone knows what inequality is when they get to feel it. Everyone knows what unfreedom is when they get to feel it. Uh, everyone knows what discrimination is when they get to feel it on their skin. And so um, the more we um, get to have people experience something before it has happened in the real world, I think the better the um, the educational value of, uh, uh, of, of that is. And so I think it's um, less about the narrative in terms of beautiful words, because I think we can be very poetic when it comes to democracy, but it's really much more about the experience, you know, making it experiential and letting um, those who do not believe in that have the experience of what that is, not in the real world, if possible. And I think that's gonna help the poetic narrative um, 
when 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 over. Obviously not if we argue directly with Xi Jinping, uh, but I'm talking in in practical practical terms. Thank you so much, Luisa, for this extremely inspiring and and motivating uh, takeaway. Uh, Adam, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I like this connection between the uh, economical aspects uh, and this transactional cost and the operation of NGOs, because uh, in my opinion, uh, we tend to neglect this a little bit, because we treat this um, civil society activism not only in terms of uh, getting proper grants for our activities, uh, uh, but also we do not uh, appreciate how devastating is the rule of law crisis uh, in such countries like Poland or Hungary, I can imagine may maybe in some other countries that, uh, for example, at certain point, you lost access to private donors because they don't want to get into any contact with anybody who would be regarded as a, you know enemy of the state at a given moment. That even private individuals start uh, to be afraid of giving your donations because you know they, uh, they don't know who will get access to this uh, uh, information. That basically this uh, kind of, you are starting to live in an environment in which the even like a decision of making like a, some small payment to some uh, NGO is becoming an act of, uh, uh, of courage. Uh, and I think uh, our, uh, I think the European Union should take into account, and I hear I follow what uh, Marta said, that Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union is about European values, but it is not only about rule of law and human rights. It is just about building civil society, that all those uh, values that are enshrined there are about building independent civil uh, society, and that should be the role of the European Union to protect it. And that the European Union should notice that uh, it is not only there is not only a need for a roadmap like the grant strategy, uh, proper funding for NGOs, but also that the change is happening on the margins of what we are usually perceiving by uh, uh, by civil society. I will just give you one uh, additional information where I see a threat, maybe, I, I don't know whether the same situation uh, is already in Hungary, but there is what, right, right now one motion pending before the Polish Constitutional Court claiming that the compulsory uh, belongingness of attorneys and legal advisors to the legal, uh, to the professional association is contrary to the constitution, that apparently it is in the interest of clients to have uh, better access to different uh, legal professions and so, and so on. So let's imagine that the constitutional court is making a judgment along those lines. It means the destruction of the independent bar association. It means that lawyers that want to have uh, to, to earn some you know, money would have to establish some new associations that would have so-called positive contacts with the, uh, with the states. So it is already becoming kind of a China scenario. Uh, but without independent lawyers, you cannot dream about any strategic litigation, uh, not mentioning, you know, independent courts. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I mean that, that you know, maybe the Bar Association is just a, a very specific part of the civil society. Uh, but, you know, it is this moment when the European Union should already see it, when there should be already a reaction. You know, listen, guys, don't, uh, miss, uh, don't uh, mess up with this because it may create a lot of uh, problems from the point of view of the European integration uh, and respect for the EU values because the bar association is independent. So what I'm trying to say that, you know, that we may concentrate on some big issues, but at the same time, change is coming on and on and on concerning some, uh, some issues that are regarded as not being like in the, in the major interest of the, of the European uh, Union. You know, the same is with the prosecutor's office. You know, we are talking so much about uh, pressure on courts, and at the same time, prosecutor's office is just completely uh, unaccountable for any uh, violations of law, for any political prosecutions, and so, and so on. So, so I think you know that we should look at this uh, more uh, like as a bigger environment, uh, not just uh, concentrate on uh, one or two specific issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, for this summary. And Melissa, I think you have the opportunity now. Uh, to, to provide us the closing words 
at least in substantial form uh, before I close uh, the event also formally. So please, you have the floor. Just pick up on some of the comments um, in response to to Jovia Banuta's question about the um, the U.S. sort of ecosystem of NGOs, and I will I will point out that I think part of what that is about is we are just lucky to have so many different kinds of organizations, so many informal and formal organizations. So, pointing to what Luisa said earlier, that there needs to be a cultivation of so many different types of of activism and organizations, and sometimes it's informal, and sometimes it's individuals, and sometimes it's formal organizations. Um, but then I will also note that part of that community is um, that there is a development, again, of these core um, competencies. And I think Marta uh, pointed to some of those competencies and their needs in terms of, you know, organizations as they develop, they go through stages and they sort of learn then how to reach out to their constituencies and they sort of reach, you know, learn how to build coalitions. And I think, you know, in some ways it's very similar to um, political development. Um, and so I think that you know, I'm hoping that one thing that USAID funding is trying to do in the region is to support that development of different kinds of organizations, but then also um, helping in helping formalized NGOs as they get bigger to develop ways of maintaining their connections to um, the constituencies or the people that they're trying to represent um, so they can continue to have that link and that legitimacy as they move forward. Um, and that legitimacy can then also help with some of this backlash that we see against civil society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And uh, because we are really approaching the end of our time, uh, I would like to say a big thank you to our panelists, to you for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, also to International IDEA for the joint endeavor with this event, and especially to you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us today, even in Europe at such a late hour. If you are interested in further events organized by GMF's Engaging Central Europe program, then please follow us on Twitter uh, or Facebook. I provided the appropriate uh, um, um, addresses via the chat. And uh, just would like to say to you, thank you again, and have a great evening and goodbye. Thank you.